So let's get started. We are, let me start with the uh, uh, textbooks first, the kind of books which I'm not going to strongly recommend, but I'm going to just list the books which you may wish to consult during the course of this <coughs> class. <coughs> Some of you already know what these books are, uh, but as there are new students, let me list them. <coughs> there are uh, the first book which I am going to refer to is the J.J. Sakurai's Sakurai Modern Quantum Mechanics. We have been using the second edition of this book in the past. I have noticed that perhaps there is a new edition, a third one. I don't know whether there will be anything new in that third edition because this man is dead more by more than 20 years now. So if there is a new edition, it must have been done by some of his former students. Therefore, I will still stick to the edition that we are used to so that you don't have to go and buy a new one or look for it. The second one, which might be useful in consulting again, as I said, this is a self-contained book still, self-contained class, is Eugene Merzbacher. Merzbacher. And that is the quantum mechanics and that's the second edition, third edition, I don't remember. The first and second and perhaps the third. The latest edition is, I guess, is the third edition. And this edition is much better than the previous ones because it's more developed, so therefore you may find it useful. And I think we have copies in sale in our bookstore, I, these dark blue, big, big size books. <coughs> Well, I used to teach from this book in the past, particularly the 507, for certain reasons. Well, he, has, he had his undergraduate education in Turkey. You know, he's, he's of Turkey origin, he's originating from Turkey, therefore I had some sympathy for him in the past, but anyway, I think this book is slightly better than it. So these two are for the non-relativistic quantum mechanics part of the course. The, this course is composed of two major parts. The first part will be the advanced non-relativistic quantum mechanics, which will take about five to six weeks approximately. I'm not 100% sure with the way it goes. As we are going to include the scattering theory, it may be a little longer than I have, I envisage that this might be at least six weeks, but still, so this is the first major part. The, the references for the second part are, <clears throat> let me list them as number three instead of going into two different groups. It is the Bjorken and Rell, the famous, historically famous book, Relativistic Quantum Mechanics. That is sometimes referred to as the volume one of two volume sets. The second volume is on quantum field theory. So this is a very old book, but a very, how do you say, elegant book. Years ago, I have learned my relative quantum mechanics from that book some, some many years ago, but I still, I think this style is quite modern, although there are slightly more modern books than this one. I have a special, affiliation to it, so that's the reason why I have wanted to mention. The fourth is, again, J.J. Sakurai, another book by J.J. Sakurai, although this book has a defect, slight defect. It uses the ancient metric, the imaginary time metric, that is. So it is a bit outdated in the sense that relativistic metric is old. Still, it is a good book, obviously, very, very good book, as a matter of fact. And the title is Advanced quantum mechanics, advanced in the sense that it is the relativistic quantum mechanics. So the title is a bit misleading. It is relativistic quantum mechanics, really. The last one I would like to refer to 
is a very strange book, really, because it's strange in the following sense. It's pedagogically very useful because it is written by this guy who has written many books on essentially all fields of physics from statistical mechanics to mechanics and electrodynamics and then several volumes in quantum mechanics, symmetries, introduction, relativistic and quantum field theory. Uh, although uh, it has the danger of sort of suppressing the creativity of the students a little bit. There is a danger that students may wish to memorize the proofs which is given in gory detail in this book. Okay, so I warn you against those trick. However, the book is obviously a pedagogically very useful one and the title is Relativistic Quantum Mechanics. I'm sure you, most of you have seen it before because it's a large size Springer book which essentially can give, provides all the details of any proof in the relativistic quantum mechanics. So this second part is for the relativistic quantum mechanics section of this course. And I have to warn you that along the way you create some free time to fill the gap if there is any of course. For I, I don't want to hurt your feelings of course. Most of you know this is special relativity theory quite well I presume. If you have any shortcoming in relativistic, special relativity theory, please try to fill that in because you will need this. When we try to engage quantum mechanics with the special theory of relativity, obviously you need to know the special theory of relativity quite well. So let me int introduce here a warning statement, special theory of relativity. And I mention always some references, although you are free to choose your own reference in filling that gap. The ideal one, if you have seen already the classical electrodynamics part two, there are special chapters in that course in the formalism of special theory of relativity. I don't think that this modern physics, the, the special theory of relativity covered in the undergraduate modern physics is not sufficient, obviously, because we are going to uh, for construct the formalism in the four-dimensional Poincaré space. So you'll need four-dimensional vector notation and really a sophisticated language of special theory of relativity. So I suggest if you haven't done so in the past, some of you at least haven't done that, refer Consult Jackson's book of classical electrodynamics, which is the textbook of our course in, on that subject. I think chapter 11, 12, I think, oh, did, that was the case, right? Chapter 11 and 12 of Jackson will be quite useful for this. CED is classical electrodynamics in short, okay. So it is, it, those chapters are particularly useful in providing you some introductory knowledge in the formalism, on the formalism of the, the theory of special relativity. So these are <laughs> the books and I'm sure you'll find uh, dozens of other books in the internet and some of them may be quite uh, suitable for your own taste to carry out your own special studies. Use any of them, but be careful against the uh, pollutions. There are some pollution of knowledge obviously in the internet. Some, some of them may be wrong. So try to stick to the, the classically time-tested ones. This is a subset of those good ones and there will be other good ones obviously. So this is the books I'm going to use. The program is already fixed and so we are not going to say much about the program. It's always have been these days. That's Friday, three hours. We are going to have the breaks, 10 minutes break between the three hours, of course. There is no problem about that. And now concerning the midterms, most of you know the style that I have. There are two midterms and one final and along the way somewhere either in between or at the end of the 
we, at the end of everything, we have usually, I usually gave in the past a fourth exam as a sort of, as a sort of makeup of any of the bad exams that you had in the past. So I don't want to call them a midterm exam for midterm makeup or final makeup. It's a general makeup. It, it's in, the intention is to assist you in upgrading your grades. And the midterms, I have to perhaps uh, decide on the dates of the midterm because I have to report to the department as well. Therefore, I will let you know next week uh, and I, we will put it in the internet as well so that you will know the official dates. And concerning the exact dates of the exam, we'll talk about it privately. We are not going to use the classroom time, obviously. I never, I cannot afford to use class time for uh, exams. We are going to do, carry out the exams in private times, special times, so that we don't lose a two, a three hours block for the exam because there's so much to cover as I will describe now the contents. So let me, Define the, let me introduce the materials to be covered in this class. So, as we have agreed upon that we are going to start from the realistic hydrogen atom, which is going to be a general application of the time-independent perturbation theory formalism because you have told me that you, you have seen that formalism already so it's going to give me some free time to cover other things. So the first subject is real hydrogen atom and fine structure. Let me say a few sentences before really moving into the detailed discussion of the subject. Well, uh, the hydrogen atom is one of the most popular examples, right, of the, to illustrate the basic principles of quantum mechanics on. The other example is the harmonic oscillator. Hydrogen atom, the naivest, the simplest approach to hydrogen atom is based on the Coulomb Hamiltonian, which sort of mimics the planetary motion, right? You have the Coulomb potential and then you can work out the spectrum of the hydrogen atom exactly using the Schrodinger equation for the stationary states which is the Hamiltonian eigenvalue equation really. So that of course is a quite good in describing the global structure of the hydrogen atom. If you would like to get into the real details obviously it, there is more to hydrogen atom than the Coulomb Hamiltonian. There are several additional terms that we have to in, include into the Hamiltonian to get a more realistic approach and these are mostly originating from the relativity theory. And you may say why the relativity theory comes in at this stage? Relativity theory comes in at this stage as I am going to elaborate on more detail eventually because the average speed of the electron in a hydrogen is quite high. It is not at the Newtonian regime. Of course, it's not in the extreme Einsteinian regime, but it's in between. And there is a very quick and nice way of estimating the average speed of the electron in the atom using some semi-classical uh, arguments. And then you see that it's alpha, the fine structure constant times the speed of light. There's these two beautiful constants coming in to describe the average, average speed of the electron in the atom. So alpha is about 1%, a little less than 1% really, times the 300,000 kilometers per second is quite high huh? as compared to the Newtonian velocity. So these relativistic effects, because it's moving semi-relativistically, all these relativistic uh, all these correction associated with this relativistic motion is to be included to modify the Hamiltonian, Coulomb Hamiltonian, to make it more realistic. So it's a beautiful subject in its own right because there are going, there's going to be so many beautiful stuff that we are going to discuss vis-a-vis -vis the hydrogen atom. That's the, the most 
uh, characteristic example of the quantum theory. So I have to also warn you, some of you, if you have any gaps in your background, you have to know the addition of angular momenta quite well in order to appreciate the uh, details of this particular issue. Addition of angular momenta. Well, the simplest example of addition of angular momenta are the orbital angular momentum plus the spin, or, or spin angular momentum. Why? Because the electron intrinsically carrying that spin or intrinsically carrying a quantum mechanical entity called the spin, then of course it's moving around around the nucleus, so it has an orbital angular momentum plus this intrinsic one. So the total angular momentum, which is the conserved con the conserved quantity in this problem, is to be used. Therefore, you need to know how to add these two vector angular momenta. Adding two uh, vector quantities to angular momenta is not a trivial job, and it is it constitutes the foundation of the famous theory of group representations. If you would like to go higher up level, so I invite you to do a bit of private reading if you haven't. Some of you already know this, but some new ones may need to refer to that particular chapters of either 507 or 431, whichever you find more suitable. The second subject that we are going to move into is the quantum mechanical pictures. Well, the real motivation of why these different pictures have been introduced in the first place will be illustrated along the way when I introduce those subjects in detail. But let me just, to give you a quick idea, to list the possible pictures that I'm going to discuss. The first one is the Schrodinger picture, and the second one is Heisenberg picture, and these pictures are uh, referred to by the scientists who have developed them, of course, Schrodinger and Heisenberg are the two great names in the history of the quantum mechanics. And the third one is the Dirac, and this is the third grade, obviously, in the history of quantum mechanics, and they have all their the, own versions of pictures. Well, pictures may sound a little different in Turkish, of course. That's not, this is a framework, really. Say that it's a framework of discussing quantum theory, quantum mechanics. And as I said, there are several reasons why doing this. Let me quickly remind you, for example, what is the difference between the Schrodinger and Heisenberg picture based on a well-known example. As I have mentioned, there are two very famous examples that we elaborate on usually to mm, let me introduce a new concept in quantum theory. One is the hydrogen atom. It's a laboratory, essentially. The other is the harmonic oscillator. Let's think of the harmonic oscillator. Discussion of the harmonic oscillator problem, quantum mechanical harmonic oscillator, obviously. In one, of course, ideal picture is Schrodinger picture. Well, what you do is you use the Schrodinger equation with the potential quadratic in x, x squared, that is. And then you solve the Schrodinger equation to define the energy eigenvalues and the energy eigenfunctions. You end up having those discrete levels of the energy eigenfunctions and the Hermit polynomials come out to be the energy eigenfunctions. And then from that on, you can propose any kind of question and answer using those solutions, energy eigenvalues, energy eigenfunctions. Well, whereas in the Heisenberg's version, that's Heisenberg picture, what you introduce is, of course, you'll see that the time evolution equations are not in terms of the state functions, but the operators themselves. Therefore, what you do is time dependence of the operators, which eventually lead you to the introduction of the creation and annihilation operators, a beautiful subject in its own right then you answer the same type of physical questions using these different types of solutions. 
but essentially coming up with exactly the same answers, obviously. Physics is unique. Whichever formalism you use, whether it's the Schrodinger equation or the Heisenberg equations, which in terms of the creation and annihilation operators, you come up with the same physical answers. So these are the most well-known example of the, on the distinction between two different pictures. Well, Dirac picture is a little more involved because it is in between the Schrodinger and Heisenberg pictures. Both the state functions and the operators carry time dependence, therefore, it is a beautiful picture in that sense, and it's going to be useful for our treatment of time-dependent problems. So that brings me already time-dependent problems issue, time-dependent problems. Well, time-dependent problems are very realistic because as we are always thinking of interactive interaction systems and the most typical interactions, the electromagnetic interactions, atoms in electromagnetic fields essentially, whether they are constant or time-dependent is of course depending on the specific nature of the problem. <coughs> so if, if you have electromagnetic theory, it's a wave, right, oscillates. Therefore, to get a realistic uh, this description of the physics, you need to refer to time-dependent potentials. Thus, you need the full time-dependent Schrodinger equation, and you have to develop formalisms appropriate for these discussions. Well, there are only very, very few specific cases which you can handle exactly. Some of you already know, seen it. Two state problems. Apart from the two state problems, we cannot handle these problems exactly. We have to resort to approximation techniques, as always. If you cannot symbolically solve them exactly, then you have to resort to approximation techniques. Although, in the last 20 years or so, with the advent of powerful computational techniques, we can handle any problem exactly through numerical analysis. But if you want symbolic analysis, then you have to resort to approximation formalism. And perturbation theories are uh, the, most, the most popular, at least in the uh, quantum mechanical framework, approximation techniques, although there are other alternatives. Variational techniques, WKB approximations, etc., etc. So I'm not going to really e refer to anything else. I refer you to do. If you need those kind of formalism, you have to carry out your own reading on your own. So perturbation theories are the ones that I'm going to use. So what are the subsections of this section four? Is one is the time dependent perturbation theory. Perhaps I have to add um, something before that. It's not really something. Quantum mechanical pictures, and I, I will add a additional statement on this title. It is time evolution problem. You'll see the importance of why Although it is self-explanatory, it is contained when you have time-dependent Schrodinger equation, obviously you are talking about time evolution. Time evolution on, it, on its own right is an interesting problem. I will uh, illustrate it in detail for the Schrodinger and the Dirac picture cases, but Heisenberg picture, will, it's not relevant for the Heisenberg picture because the states are frozen in time, therefore they are not going to evolve. What are evolving is different than the, the uh, two other two pictures. Well, time evolution, as I said, is interesting because it is a formal solution of an equation of motion for the states. And the unitarity of that time evolution plays such a crucial role that, in the, for example, in, in, there is a new research field called quantum information theory. And there is an important problem in there, coherence and decoherence. So if you have external, external interferences which 
uh, introduce additional non-hermitian effects, then the time evolution is not a unitary. If the time evolution is not unitary, there is so many interesting phenomena coming up. As I said, it's an active research area. Therefore, I wanted to touch upon this time evolution problem at this introductory level so that you can resort to quantum information theory problems some of you have been involved in the past. So time-dependent perturbation theory is the next subject. We are going to develop that formalism based on the time evolution problem in the Dirac picture. So it's going to be a rather useful input for this discussion. And then we will spend some time, quite some time on illustrating this formalism on several uh, uh, physical examples. One is the constant potentials. Well, some of you may find this paradoxical. I'm talking about time-dependent uh, perturbation theory. I'm still talking about constant potential. This constancy is rather interesting. It is time independent, say zero, till a certain time and then you turn on suddenly at a given time and then still retain it time independent. This sudden jump is the simplest example of time dependent potentials. That's the reason why I call it constant potential. Perhaps to have something in your mind, remember this is the VT, this is the time axis. And that's the kind of jump I am talking about. It is independent of time after a certain time, say take it to be zero usually, and it's independent of time before. There is a sudden jump, very singular jump however. That's the time dependence we are going to use. And it's a beautiful problem. It's going to be the at the foundation of many of the problems that we are going to discuss. And second class is harmonic perturbation. Sorry, let's call it harmonic potentials, perhaps, because this is already perturbation theory, harmonic potentials. Then we are going to talk about Fermi's golden rule. Yeah, I'm sure you are going to appreciate this theorem and the Fermi's genius uh, through these simple, simple discussions. Fermi's golden rule. He has several golden rules, but one of them is the one we are going to use to describe the transition rates, golden rule. And then we are going to uh, use those formalisms to discuss in detail atoms in classical radiation field. I, I will qualify this word classical because it's an important thing. Notice that in quantum mechanics, the quantumness of the system is in the particle. Here it is the electron in the atom or electrons in the atom. And when we are introducing, discussing the problems of atom in radiation fields, we are going to still treat the radiation classically using Maxwell's theory. Well, actually a more realistic, a correct discussion would be together with the quantization of the radiation, but that's quantum field theory. Because in order to really quantize the radiation, you have to introduce Fox space and infinitely many oscillators. Therefore, it is beyond the level of quantum mechanics, not only this class, any quantum mechanics. If you go to the full discussion together with the quantized radiation, then you go to quantum field theory. So that's the reason why I have to underline this classical or external. Sometimes when you read the books, there's an equivalent terminology for this. Instead of classical, they say external radiation field. Because we have a very good formalism, Maxwell's formalism, to discuss these problems. Therefore, you see how nice and beautiful it will be. I will, uh, along the way, I will discuss the gauge problems as well here. Well, some of you know already that gauge, concept of gauge, gauge theories, gauge problems are the most fundamental problems nowadays in physics. Not only in high energy physics, but also it has been introduced in the condensed matter physics years ago by P.W. Anderson. That's the ferromagnetism and other forms of magnetism. 
or superconductivity or examples of gauge theories. So any modern discussion of these physical phenomena requires concept of gauge. So I want to introduce a little bit of gauge issues at this level so that you can feel closer to those issues. And spontaneous and simulated emissions obviously are examples of the same discussion. Spontaneous and simulated emissions. And the photoelectric effects. You'll like this discussion. The photoelectric effect is, of course, uh, historically very important because that's the phenomenon which was introduced in 1905 by Einstein uh, as an uh, important step forward. I'm using careful terminology as an important step forward in the way of opening up new avenue in the micro universe by uh, pointing out that through the photoelectric effect one can prove that photon which was known to be a wave since the time of Huygens for more than 100 years also have particle like nature and it carries an energy lump or momentum lump proportional to its frequency. Frequency is a, a property associated with the wave-like nature and the wave number is also a property associated with the wave-like nature of the photon. Now he says energy and the momenta are proportional to the frequency and the wave vectors. So these two different aspects particle-like nature and the wave-like nature are related depending on the regime and the conditions this entity which is called the light, you know, the most sacred and interesting entity in the universe since the time of Big Bang has this double dual structure. That's the opening up of the quantum theory, avenue to the quantum theory. And some 22 years later than this it's 1905, in 1927, Mr. De Broglie, in his PhD thesis, I invite you to think of in terms of good problems in your PhD thesis, he has discovered that an object, which is called electron, which was discovered in 1897 by J.J. Thompson, which is known to be a particle by anybody's standards because it is reflected in everything in external electric fields and magnetic fields, it has also a wave-like nature through, he proposed that. And a couple of years later than that, in 1929, it was verified to be true using diffraction experiments. So these are important phenomena. Therefore, photoelectric effect in this, under this very sophisticated level, it is to be rediscussed and we are going to rediscuss it. And you'll like the example. It's far beyond the level that Einstein has envisaged, obviously, in his 1905 paper. But you'll be very proud of yourself once you discuss this problem in such a sophisticated level. Because it is more or, more or less the same result that we are going to get by using the quantum field theory. But this is relativistic. This is non-relativistic quantum mechanics yet, and it has such a great predictive power. So that is these uh, three major chapters are on the first part of this course, which is called the Advanced Non-Relativistic Quantum Mechanics. And second part of it is the Relativistic Quantum Mechanics. And let me discuss that briefly, because the details will be provided along the way when we get, oh, by the way, sorry, I apologize. I have to add in here a new subject. Scattering theory, quantum scattering theory. Although there is a danger of losing one week, I know, because of Bayram, which is at the end of October. So again, our program may be hindered a little bit because we are going to lose that one week. Anyway, still I'm keen that this semester I have to discuss scattering theory. 
which we couldn't do last semester. So these four chapters, four issues, major issues, are the subject that we are going to, subjects that we are going to cover in the advanced non-relativistic quantum mechanical part that is the first half of this course. The second half is the relativistic quantum mechanics. So we can go on by the numbering. So it's for the fifth one is a brief review of special relativity but formalism. Special relativity, well, Lorentz transformation. Let me make it more sophisticated. Lorentz transformation. Six. Klein Gordon equation. The first attempt. First attempt on quantum mechanics. That is the Klein Gordon equation. And the problems, pathologies, rather, pathologies associated with this equation. So this first attempt, although will be a very straightforward attempt towards unifying relativity with quantum theory, will fail. And we have to go through this historical example because it's a very educative example. Why that equation couldn't have been the correct quantum mechanical equation. I'm trying to use careful terminology because eventually, in a couple of months after this, you know, there are the big giants of science who are working on this problem. 1926 was the, time, uh, the year that the non-relativistic quantum mechanics was completed, and people obviously turned their attention immediately to relativistic quantum mechanics because there is a beautiful theory of relativity, beautiful theory of quantum. Then how do mm, in how to unify them. Unification is a rather ter ter dangerous terminology, but how to, unif how to put these two concepts together and make it both quantum and relativistic. The first thing, uh, you'll see the reason why. If you were doing it on your own, the first thing which would come to your mind would be, again, this attempt, the conventional wisdom, energy momentum dispersion relation, and use it, first of all, convert them into operator equations and use it as a constructive way and you get this equation, but it's pathological, it's not the right equation as a quantum mechanical equation. Eventually it turned out to be a beautiful theory for describing scalar mesons in the context of field theory. But pro probably you'll see that in the first part of the field theory. So there are strange things happening in physics sometimes, historically. Bad for one purpose and good for another purpose, again rewived as a field theoretical equation. And the second, uh, this, now the correct relativistic quantum mechanical equation is the Dirac equation. Well, this Dirac equation subject is a rather cis rich subject because this turns out to be the correct relativistic quantum mechanical equation. We are going to construct it. And we are going to construct it, check all the consistencies, all of the properties, all the solutions. And in a sense, for four weeks, we are going to live with Dirac equation. So let me list some of the subsections associated with this one. The non-relativistic limits limit for different versions. One of them is the A, free 
B Coulomb field. And this is a beautiful, you'll see that this is a beautiful subject because that will be the place in which we are going to recover this fine structure in an exactly, we are going to derive that fine structure. And here, not only free, but in magnetic field, pure magnetic field. That's going to be another victory, G equals 2, gyromagnetic ratio equals 2, will come out and that will constitute the proof of the uh, Dirac equation being the correct relativistic quantum mechanical equation. So these issues are rather beautiful issues and we are going to also have not only, not only the non-relativistic limit but the classical limit of the Dirac equation as well. And we are going to use the Heisenberg picture to illustrate that. When you go to the classical limit that consider the expectation values of the operators for the Dirac Hamiltonian, you are going to get the Lorentz force equation beautifully. So th these are two issues, right? Classical limit and non-relativistic limit. Non-relativistic limit takes you from relativity to Newtonian regime. Classical limit keeps you at the relativistic regime, takes you from quantum to classical. I will describe this uh, in detail. You will see it's a beautiful subject in, in its own right. The covariant form and the bilinear covariance and <coughs> okay covariant form perhaps, in short, covariant form and covariance, covariance and the covariant form. And bilinear Covariance and free solutions, general solutions. properties of the general spinner solutions. Helicity, a beautiful subject which is take, will take you to the frontier of the research for the neutrino type of problems. Helicity, chirality, and all these problems will be discussed in here. So this is a very involved section of the relativistic quantum mechanics. And I will convince you that with that limited amount of you know, a graduate course, you can immediately jump to the threshold of the research in high energy physics in certain areas like neutrino physics, a beautiful subject and very active field of research nowadays obviously with the discovery that neutrinos are not massless. Although very tiny they carry mass and therefore you need all these formulas in free solutions, massive and massless and then helicity, conservation of helicity, conservation of chirality, how helicity and chirality are related Perhaps I could have listed them as different sections as well, so, but anyway. So I made my point, what are the, the kind of subjects that we are going to discuss in this class. So this is the context of this semester, composed of again two 
main groups of subjects, advanced non-relativist quantum mechanics and relativist quantum mechanics. Of course, there is yet a lot of further subjects to be covered in the field of relativist quantum mechanics, but once you understand the basics of this discussion, the, the, that is it, particularly Dirac equation, all the essentials, then you can continue on your own to discuss issues like antiparticles, charge conjugation, CP invariance, all those beautiful subjects again which are at the threshold of research nowadays. And although if we could have done it easily after these introductory information, but we will not have any time left for those, therefore that's the reason why we are not going to discuss it in detail. I forgot to mention in here that perhaps I have to add it in here. We do it anyway, although it's not a trivial matter. I have to say parity in Dirac theory. The order is somewhere in here perhaps, but you know the discussion. Even last time, last year you had an exam question about it, I guess. Some of you remember it quite well. Parity in relativistic quantum mechanics. Parity is one thing, charge conjugation is another thing. And charge conjugation time parity pro multiplied gives you the CP, which is a time reversal problem. Is another problem. All this discussion. As time permits, we'll discuss them as much as possible. <coughs> but that's a, the, the pretty condensed program which will keep us busy for the entire semester. So that's a good point to give a break. And then we'll continue after the break. <coughs>